Hello, everyone. Uh, it's very good to be uh, back here at DevOx. This is my first trip to Paris. I've never been to Paris before, so this is very exciting for me. Um, I was at DevOx, I guess, back in 2009, uh, presenting about a, a web UI automation framework. Uh, so it's very interesting to look at the web development landscape now and see how much things have changed. Uh, things are very, very different now. Uh, it's also very, very, it's incredibly exciting. Um, right, so uh, I, I'm Matthew. Um, I work at, uh, work at Yammer on the JavaScript team. I'm MDE on Twitter. Um, yeah, uh, so here, I guess to give you a little bit of uh, personal context, you can see some photos of me in various uh, compromising situations. Gives you an idea of the, the person. Um, as I said, I'm on the, the JavaScript team, and I'm going to be talking about uh, JavaScript everywhere, um, which is uh, kind of an interesting, I guess, maybe provocative title. And maybe a better title would have been something a little uh, less provocative, like JavaScript anywhere. Um, the, the point being that, uh, that JavaScript has pushed its way into a lot of areas uh, where previously, if you wanted sort of a general purpose programming language, you were limited to your, your choice of, say, Python, Ruby. Maybe if you were living in Microsoft land, you'd be using something like uh, VBScript. Um, but JavaScript is showing up everywhere now, is, is the intent. And uh, it's also important to, to note what I don't mean by JavaScript everywhere. And I don't mean only JavaScript everywhere. So, as I said, I work at Yammer, um, and this is a not particularly exhaustive list of the technologies that we use. We are firm believers in right tool for the job. And we use everything from the tried and true like Postgres and lots and lots of Java, lots of Java, to uh, the central app, which is a big uh, Rails app that still serves the REST API. We have, uh, we're a, an enterprise uh, focused company. So we have a lot of people doing C Sharp, Microsoft integrations, uh, JavaScript, Redis, React, um, of course, Node, which is one of the things I'll be talking about today. Who here has uh, ever heard of Yammer before? Okay, a few people. How many people here have actually used it? Okay, awesome. Okay, heartily encourage you to try it out. For the people who don't know what it is, it is an enterprise social network. So it is a communication and collaboration tool s in some ways similar to something like Facebook or Twitter, but for your business. Uh, significantly increases the efficiency and speed of communication within your company, the flow of information within your company. Um, so uh, as I said, I work on the JavaScript team. Uh, we uh, use JavaScript in lots of different places. The central place, obviously, is, the, uh, is the, the web UI, the JavaScript that powers the web UI. We have an extensive JavaScript library called YamJS, also known as YamJuice, that's what we call it, um, that is a fairly extensive library of utility functions, an ORM layer, and a, full, a fairly full-featured uh, UI component library. We started working on this about two years ago, and if we had started now, we might have picked something like Backbone.js. Um, but at the time, there wasn't really anything that suited our purposes uh, perfectly. We looked at Dojo widgets, UE. Uh, none of these things were exactly what we needed. Um, so we built our own stuff, as you do. Um, the same JavaScript uh, that powers the web UI for our, um, our, our web application, we also use in our desktop application. So there's a fork of it that the desktop guys customize to work inside of Air. And uh, this strategy allows us to deliver features away, uh, significantly faster uh, than we would if we were trying, uh, with our limited resources, than we, we could if we were trying to do a native app. Uh, we still talk about writing a native app. Uh, if we have the resources, that's something we're interested in doing. But right now, this has been a very, very good strategy for us, despite the limitations of Air as a runtime. Uh, we also run a little bit of JavaScript inside of Ruby, inside of Rails. Um, there's a project called the Ruby Racer that lets you embed V8 inside of uh, a Ruby process. We use that for rendering a few EJS templates. EJS is similar to ERB, or it's basically just embedded JavaScript and HTML. And of course, we do uh, some stuff with Node, which is one of the things I'll be talking about. Uh, but before I go too far into Node, it's worth mentioning or notice it, noting that the idea of JavaScript on the server isn't a particularly new thing. So it may seem 
to, to, it may seem to you that this is something that sort of happened all of a sudden. But JavaScript on the server has been around long, almost as long as JavaScript has been around. This book was published, I believe, in 1998. So this was how Netscape thought that they were going to make their money. They had a server product that they were selling. And uh, that's how they were doing business before Microsoft's illegal uh, tying practices uh, destroyed their company. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, this is a, uh, again, a probably not exhaustive list, but his uh, past and present server-side JavaScript implementations. Um, a lot of people are surprised to find out that Microsoft's IIS supports JScript and has almost as long as it's supported uh, VBScript. I think I wrote my first server-side JavaScript circa like 2000 doing uh, object-oriented stuff because VBScript at the time didn't have objects. Um, other projects like Helma, which used uh, the Rhino uh, JavaScript runtime, that's Java. Whitebeam, which was a spider monkey mixed with uh, XML. And an interesting one, Zimkey, there in the middle, was a very early attempt to do a platform as a service. Um, they're not around anymore, but they did some crazy stuff with server-side JavaScript wrapped with Perl, which sounds pretty awful now if you, if you think about it. Um, and then to, down to the more modern ones, Google App Engine, you can, it's the JVM, of course, so you can run a JS there. CouchDB, all of their end-user developer-facing features are JavaScript. And, of course, Node, which is probably, well, I'm assuming what a lot of you are, are here to hear about. It's something that a lot of people are pretty excited about. Um, but the important point is that this thing, like Node seems to have ex sort of exploded onto the scene uh, very suddenly in the last year or so. But this has been a long process, starting with Netscape dying off and the code base being open sourced, so no one really had full control over it. Um, and uh, uh, the, the Ajax rev revolution. So paradoxically, Microsoft sort of killing forward progress uh, in JavaScript over the years, uh, uh, for about a decade, I guess, actually sort of planted the seeds for the Ajax revolution because it was such a stable platform. It was able to wind its way into lots of different uh, business applications on the front end with this Ajax stuff. So I guess circa 2006, I wrote a book for SitePoint called Build Your Own Ajax uh, Web Applications. Um, so, so the Ajax thing was just sort of starting to get uh, going. And then in early 2000, a guy named Steve Yegi, who's a fairly well-known technical blogger, wrote a very long post. Um, that's kind of redundant, almost all of his posts are pretty long, about something he was calling NBL, which was his secret code for the next big language after Java. So Java's popularity was at its height, and he was trying to imagine forward to what would be the next big thing after Java. Um, and he listed a set of features that he imagined such a language would have to have, including C-style syntax, first-class functions, object orientation, basically the entire post sort of with a, with a wink and a nudge uh, describing JavaScript without actually calling it JavaScript. So he thought it was a very, very important language. And the people who were working, I think, probably on the front end could see uh, the writing on the wall, could see where these things were going. It's fairly easy. Let me put it a different way. It's incredibly difficult to replace JavaScript in the browser, with all due respect to the guys from Google working on Dart. Uh, it's incredibly uh, difficult. There are a lot of compiled to JavaScript uh, languages that people are using now, but the fundamental fact is that the native language of the browser is JavaScript. It's a lot easier to change something in one, at one point in your server. It's much easier change to make than changing everyone's browser. Um, so once you have credible server-side JavaScript, it really changes the story significantly. Uh, so the next step in this was comp competition between the JavaScript runtime uh, guys. You had Apple diving in with uh, Squirrelfish, and now it's called Nitro, I believe. Um, and then finally, Google diving in with V8 so that you have three commercially supported open source JavaScript runtimes that are all in competition to make JavaScript faster. Um, they're all, unlike um, the runtimes for languages like Ruby or Python, you also have this massive QA effort uh, by all of the people who are consuming JavaScript in the browser. So you end up with something very, very stable that's commercially supported that just keeps getting faster and faster. And V8 is sort of the latest uh, iteration in this cycle, which is why if you're a JavaScript guy, you have this sort of server-side JavaScript implementation that's like Jesus coming out of the clouds. It's very exciting. Um, so at some point, someone, uh, Ryan Dahl, uh, the creator of Node.js, decided he would take the most modern dynamic language VM 
that was for a language that was uniquely well suited to asynchronous uh, programming and marry it to this evented I.O. model and essentially provide JavaScript the standard I.O. layer that it never had because it was a browser language. So you've been able to do JavaScript on the server for a long time, but it never really felt very JavaScript-y. So programming uh, JavaScript on the server was possible with the JVM, but it still felt like sort of like you were using the JVM. Uh, Node is the first uh, server-side JavaScript implementation that really feels like you're using JS. Right, so, um, okay, so here's Hello World in Node. And uh, this was taken uh, directly off, I think it's, I'm, I don't know if it's on the new site, but this was the Hello World displayed on the original old uh, Node.js uh, website. Uh, and actually, it would be much simpler. Um, there's a much simpler version of this program in Node, which is just console.log hello world, right? And you could run that with Node, and it would, it would uh, print out hello world. But it's, it's rather telling that the Node people's uh, conception of what is the canonical hello world program is a web server, right? You, cre you create a server. It's listening uh, on port, the lead port there. You can see 1337. Um, and it just prints out hel uh, Hello World. But that gives you sort of an idea of what Node.js is, uh, is good for, one of the things that it's good for. So I'm going to take a minute here and, okay, yeah, here we are, that's better. Um, and actually go to, actually go to the console here. And you'll have to let me know if you can actually see this. So when I was thinking about this, um, obviously this is a, a sort of a Java-focused conference. And I was trying to imagine if I were a, a, Java, a Java guy who was sort of dubious about this idea of JavaScript on a server, what, what would be something that would be interesting to me to see? So I figured that a good, uh, good thing to look to see would be a very quick uh, uh, HTTP proxy. And you get an idea of how quickly you can build a, a scalable, fast, HTTP proxy with, uh, with Node. So I'm going to start off here, and you need, of course, the HTTP library, and then you need a server. I code comma first, so if any of you JavaScript people are offended by this, you may want to avert your eyes. Um, so you need a server, and it's very simple. It's just HTTP.create server, right? Very easy to do. So. Um, this gives you an idea uh, also, uh, I, should, I should probably point out to you, there are easier ways to do this. There are libraries that will do this sort of thing for you now, obviously. Um, the, the newer uh, stream.proxy is a very, very simple, uh, much simpler way to do this. But this gives you an idea of how easy the hard way would be and gives you an idea of some of the sort of node idioms for programming, what this evented program programming model looks like uh, in JavaScript. So the server is an instance, or is a subclass. JavaScript doesn't have classes, but it, it's, an ex, it's an extended version of Node's sort of base fundamental programming unit, which is the event emitter, right? So it's evented programming. Uh, so basically, you're waiting for event, uh, interesting events to happen in your program. OK, so, so I'm, li I'm listening for requests, obviously, right? So let me go ahead and do server.listen. We'll listen on port 4000 of localhost, right? This is all pretty simple, and I'll go ahead and log it to the console like, I don't know, uh, server, server running, right? So you can see we've got a server running, right? So let's go over here and start up the server, and go over here to Chrome, and we'll uh, listen, for, yeah, here's localhost 4000. I'm sure I've got the slash slash. Okay, what we've got is, that's good, it means it's listening. We've got a server that is essentially doing nothing, right, with the request. Let's at least log howdy, which I'm for originally from Texas. And this is Texas language for hello, bonjour. I should have started this with bon bonjour y'all, probably. Um, okay, so we'll restart the server. Um, go back to localhost 4000. And again, nothing in the browser, but we can see the little howdy, which tells, that, uh, tells us that, yes, it's getting requests. All right, so in reality, can you guys see this okay? Can everybody see? This is big enough? Okay. So in reality, this uh, event handler that we've set on the request event gets two arguments, the server request and the response. All right. Make sure, actually, with, yes, we could make that a tiny bit bigger. 
and it's not going to wrap. There we go. Um, yeah, so it's, the re it's a, a request and response pair. The request is the request coming from the, the browser. The response is what we're writing out to the browser. The server request is a readable stream, which is another important concept in Node. Streams, everything streams, nothing blocks. So the server request is a readable stream, and the server response is a writable stream. So we're going to create a couple of variables we're going to use here. Uh, devox. We'll try proxying the devox site. Um, let's see. And we need a client request object to make the request, and we need some ops to use when we're creating the request. OK. So let's create the ops. The ops is just a simple object literal with a host in it, which is the host that we just set, right? And again, with the comma first. Um, let's see. Um, we need a path which is the ser same as the server requests URL, right? So at this point, you're going to begin to see how, quick, how s simple and easy it is to begin bolting these things together. Uh, and then we need some headers. And here's where I'm going to get a little sloppy on y'all headers. So normally, what you would probably want to do if you're doing this in a clean way is create a new object for your headers and selectively copy stuff in. But I'm going to do this the crappy, sloppy way because it's JavaScript, and it's OK to be a little sloppy in JavaScript, right? So uh, I'm actually making a change to the server request, the request from the browser. I'm changing its host to the host that we want it to be so the real host doesn't see localhost 4000 as the requested host, right? OK. So now we're going to do a client request equals HTTP.request with these ops. All right. If you guys see me making syntax errors, flag me here. OK, so a client request we've created. And as you might imagine, the client request is also an event emitter, right? So it's going to uh, emit some other events. I'm going to go ahead and do this client, dot, uh, client request, sorry, dot end so I don't forget. This is the equivalent of the server dot listen. This fires off the request, right? But the client request. Can you guess what, uh, what event will be listening for that? The response, right? Very, very simple and expected. And we get the client response here. So you can see now that we've got the server request, server response, client request, client response, right? It's a nice, um, consistent uh, pairing here. And as soon, so as soon as that response comes back from the client for that request, we're going to immediately do server resp dot write. We're going to write the headers out. Uh, and we're going to use the client responses uh, status code. Right? And it's headers. Again, we're just recycling the headers client resp. If I could actually type dot headers. You see how easy this is. OK, so now that we've written the headers out, we're going to start streaming data. So again, this is Node.js. Everything is, thank you very much. Uh, response, oh, thank you, the argument. Perfect. Thank you guys very much. I'll probably do that again, so don't hesitate to raise your hand. Um, right, so uh, the, the client response, again, is also an event emitter. Uh, everything streams, nothing blocks. So as data is streaming in from the client response, we're going to be streaming it back to the browser, right? So um, uh, uh, client response resp dot on data. So whenever we get a chunk of data from the client, we're going to write it out. And I'll just go ahead and try to speed this along here for y'all. When it ends, we want to do the same thing. And, and of course, there's no arguments Oops. for that one. So OK. So as soon as that chunk of data comes in, that's, that's not right. we're just going to write the data out for each chunk. This is all streaming. Nothing is, there's no uh, piece of processing that is sitting there waiting for a response to come back. So while, it's, while these events are not firing, the JS interpreter can be happily processing other requests, doing other work. Um, that's the strength of this evented programming model, resp dot end. OK. I believe that's it. So the other thing is that we'll do is we'll also console.log, you know, requesting. 
and then the server rack dot Earl. Earl, if I can spell Earl. All right, okay. So I think this, this should be good here. We'll see if this actually works. We'll see what, okay, no syntax errors. That's a good sign. So let's see here. I'm going to go back over here. Oops, to, do, 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 do. hang on, let me, let me fire up Firefox again here. Oh, there we go, okay. And get a, a URL that we want to use. So I'm going to try to get today's schedule. We'll just try to proxy today's schedule. All right. Okay. See if this actually works. Or if we got, nope. Okay, ho, cannot set property ho, yeah, it's plural, not singular. I knew I would fuck something up there. Okay, let's try it again. Okay, and there, in there, there we go. There's today's schedule. Um, so you see how easy, what was that, maybe 10 minutes or something like that to build a proxy? And the programming model, even though it's invented, is pretty easy to understand, right? It's not, uh, it's just JavaScript. You know, JavaScript is a language that kind of, I think pretty much anyone can, can uh, learn how to use. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of uh, one of the things that, uh, that Node is good for. Let me get back to where we were here. And it also gives you um, some little bit of insight, a little uh, taste of some of the fundamental building blocks of uh, programming with Node, uh, which is the event emitter, everything. Uh, uh, there's interesting events that you listen for and respond to, uh, the readable, writable streams, and then callbacks, um, which, uh, well, maybe not precisely callbacks, they're event handlers, but it's essentially the, the same idea. So specifically what we're using Node.js at Yammer for, uh, the first use that we found for it was uh, developers, front-end developers, uh, HTTP proxy. So we had this idea of building JavaScript for the deployment. Uh, we run a tiny little Node.js proxy for all the JS developers when they're working in development mode that does an on-the-fly build. Uh, so it intercepts the request for the package, uh, builds the package uh, off of, from the files, the source files off the file system, minifies it on the fly. Um, uh, it was, was a really uh, smart use, nice use of Node uh, very early on. The next thing we found for it was uh, using, uh, using it for build, build scripts. Um, there's a project called uh, Jake that I started working on about, I, about two years ago, a little more than two years ago, that is essentially uh, an, a JavaScript equivalent to uh, make or rake. If you use rake, you're going to feel very comfortable using Jake. It has all the uh, features that you would sort of expect in a basic build tool. Um, might make a replacement for something like Ant. Doesn't do uh, a dependency management like Maven. It's a simple uh, build tool. Uh, you can define prerequisites, tasks. Um, there are some extra niceties like a package task that gives you shortcuts for packaging things up uh, for distribution. Uh, if you're a JavaScript programmer, you would probably be interested in the npm publish task, which makes publishing your packages to npm, which is Node's package, package manager, makes it very trivial to do that. Also has a couple of extra niceties and uh, Jake exec utility, which uh, makes it easier to do shelling out. Uh, this is important with Node because IO is all asynchronous, including shelling out, which is uh, kind of terrible, but uh, there you go. Um, also includes some file utilities, some things uh, to, uh, to give you a synchronous uh, API for manipulating the file system, uh, like a CP uh, hyphen R, RMRF, that's cross-platform. So you can write your build scripts uh, in Windows land and deploy them uh, on Linux, write on the Mac and deploy on Windows, uh, whatever you want to do. So here's an example of a namespaced set of Jake tasks. It's the foo namespace. Uh, one is a synchronous task, and the other one is an asynchronous task. Of course, Jake has to uh, support async execution, because anytime you're going to go do some I.O., you're going to go off into the ether and then come back again. Uh, so the way of uh, flagging a task as, as asynchronous is this extra um, optional argument at the end with the flag. And then whenever you come back uh, from your callback, this guy is just shelling out and doing uh, an LS on the file system and printing it out. Uh, there's a global complete that you call whenever the callback finishes that pokes Jake's execution queue and uh, has it continue forward. So you can be as asynchronous as you want uh, with Jake. Uh, the other piece that we're using uh, at Yammer is the, the Getty web framework. It's at gettyjs.org if you want to go check it out. Uh, it has also been around a little over two years, I guess, but has sort of taken off 
a lot uh, more significantly in the last six to eight months. Uh, a couple of other people have joined the project and are evangelizing and doing tutorials for this. Um, it's a fairly simple structured uh, web framework uh, for Node. If you've ever used something like Rails or Django or Merb, you'll be very uh, comfortable with it. Uh, originally started as a way to do very simple either MVC or RESTful uh, resource-based API uh, creation for Node. So to create an app, you just install Getty, obviously, and then Getty app, my app, and it gives you a nice app scaffold. You do go into the app and Getty resource, you know, foo, and you get the foo resource with the correct uh, RESTful HTTP verbs mapped onto the CRUD actions. It makes it very, very simple to do. Uh, uh, it makes it e very easy to create uh, web applications in a structured way with Node. Uh, the model code is still fairly embryonic. We don't have a nice uh, query API uh, quite yet. Some of that has to do with the fact that uh, modern web development is a lot more, particularly with Node, is a lot more about real time and streaming. Getty tries to make it very easy to allow you to do these low level things while also giving you the MVC structure for your app where you, uh, where you want it. Um, uh, there's also the issue of poly what we call, what I've heard people call polyglot persistence, which is this idea that a model may have uh, sources from uh, a traditional relational database to a document store to a key value store. Uh, and Node is particularly good at uh, amalgamating data from uh, multiple sources, but that's not something we've done in a structured way with Getty as of yet. So the user-facing uh, services at Yammer that we actually have that are Node-based, there's, there's two. The first one is a file and image uh, upload service that is based on the, the Getty framework that I was just mentioning. Uh, and then the other one is a slightly newer service that does real-time collaborative documents, very similar to something like Google Docs. It's based on a different uh, open source project. So our upload service has been in service a little over a year, I guess, which is like eons in node time. So really, it's been around kind of a long time. It uh, really plays to node strengths because it's all streaming. Um, so we were able to do a fairly uh, high uh, tr uh, number of upload transactions with a fairly small number. We originally started off with three EC2 units. Uh, th yeah, three uh, no node nodes on EC2. Um, it does the thumbnailing for images right on the machine, just shelling out. Uh, and then it has to contact some remote third-party services for things like video transcoding and then converting docs and PDFs and some of these other things into a format that the browser can read. Uh, node is, turns out to be very, very good at this. Uh, there's also another connection back to the browser as the upload and the image processing is happening that pushes status to the browser. We're using Corsi uh, uh, multi-part XHR for this. Uh, yeah, uh, we're doing, I guess, uh, Yammer, we just passed the 4 million user mark, so we're still not at a uh, huge scale yet. Um, the, this service is doing, well, last time I checked, was doing about 3, 000, uh, 300K uploads per month, and that includes uh, large video files, large images. Uh, so it's scaling uh, without, without any significant issues. The other, the other uh, user-facing project that we have that's Node is this Pages feature, which is real-time multi-user uh, documents. You can be typing, and you can see off over in another part of the document someone else is typing. Uh, so it really, uh, really reduces the friction and collaboration, uh, makes it very, very easy. Uh, and it's based on the Etherpad Lite project, which is a Node.js port of a older Java and Scala project. It's been around for a while. Um, yeah, so now that I've talked a little bit about what we do, it's probably worth talking about uh, some of the specific Node idioms or specific uh, issues that you run into coding for Node and then issues that you run into running a Node service in production for real users. So the first one is the two sides of the JavaScript coin, right? Uh, the JavaScript strength is that it's an incredibly powerful language. It's very flexible and it's very amenable to this iterative uh, development process. The bad side of JavaScript is that it's a very powerful language that's very flexible and is very amenable to this uh, iterative development process. So it makes it very, very easy to add a new feature here, add a new feature there, and keep iterating, keep iterating. The speed of development is very, very fast. But if you're not careful, you end up iterating yourself into a corner and you end up with uh, the Node.js equivalent of the old like PHP app where there was like the SQL queries and the HTML and 
everything kind of all mixed together in one place. So if you're not very proactive uh, about refactoring, you end up with a big unmaintainable mess, which is one of the reasons we ended up uh, with Getty, because it imposes a little bit of structure up front. Uh, you n sort of know where things go, and it's a little harder to get yourself into this situation. And the insult to injury here, the thing that makes it even worse, is that so much of a server program is I.O. There's lots and lots of asynchrony that you have to wrestle with. Um, so there's this inside-out method of execution. And if you're a JavaScript programmer, if you're JavaScript brain damaged the way I am, it's less of an issue. It feels fairly natural. But when you're new to the idiom, this code where you have a thing, and then there's indentations that's a callback, and there's more of a thing, and then there's another thing that's inside that, it's this sort of inside-out execution model where it starts at the top and then unwinds backwards. Uh, it's not nice and sequential from top to bottom. Uh, and it's, it, it's a, it is a hurdle to get over uh, for people initially. Uh, and then to make that worse, you have while loops and, and for loops and if-thens that also uh, have this asynchrony. Uh, and there are a lot of programmers who are doing things with now with Node who are not JavaScript programmers. That's actually one of the interesting things now about the Node ecosystem is you have a lot of front end JavaScript JavaScripty guys now making their way back to the server. It's, wow, this is awesome. I get to do all of this new stuff. They may not understand the, pro the problem domain very well. You also have a lot of server programmers and low-level protocol guys who are very interested in this who don't really understand JavaScript very well. Uh, so it's very easy to end up, especially for someone who's an inexperienced uh, JS developer, to create, uh, to create memleak, for example, because the code execution path is not linear. It's not always completely clear what's happening, uh, what's happening where. So here's a good example of this. This is a synchronous uh, API example, uh, pseudocode for, for JavaScript. Updating some stuff out of a database. You grab some, you get some stuff, you iterate over the stuff, you update with the params, and then you, you're done. It's very nice and simple, top to bottom execution. Here's what it would look like in the async world. So you can't return, right? Because everything's happening asynchronously. So you'd have to pass your callback to this and this would call with the true result when it's done. The DB fetch is also asynchronous, so there's yet another callback nested in there. Uh, and of course, each of the updates are doing some sort of I.O., so they're all asynchronous as well, right? So uh, you've got this standard pattern where you uh, keep a count, increment the count, and then when you're done, call a callback, right? It's not that hard to understand, but it is a little more cognitive overhead, uh, particularly if you're new to this. You may look at this and think it looks awful and not understand it. It's also uh, worth noting, too, that it may be actually more performant to do all of these updates because they can happen concurrently, right? You're not blocking, waiting for one update to happen for the other update to happen. So it's speedier, potentially, but it's not as easy to understand top to bottom. It doesn't compose as well. But, okay, so there are a lot of people who have seen, have seen this uh, programming paradigm, and there's the complaint that this is too hard, okay? So I don't know, it is harder in some respects. I don't know if it's too hard. Okay, so this is the example I always like to trot out for people who talk about asynchrony being too hard. Who here has heard of jQuery? Right, okay, it should be everybody at this point, unless you're living in a cave, right? Who here has actually used jQuery Ajax for something? Okay, right, probably almost everybody. So this is a great example of exactly that kind of asynchrony. It's a callback function. It's the success function, right? You go off and you do a thing, and when you're done, do the other thing, right? Um, the event binding is another example. This is just binding a click listener to a div, foo. This is evented programming. It's exactly the same, right? So J the jQuery guys have actually done something incredibly difficult, not specifically with this API, but writing a library that's easy for normal people to use, right? jQuery is incredibly popular not because it's aimed at the computer research intelligentsia crowd, right? It's aimed at normal guys just trying to get shit done, right? And it would be incredibly difficult to argue that there's not a lot of guys getting a lot of shit done with jQuery and this API, right? So clearly it's not too hard, right? Okay, so... On top of that, there are some mitigating, there's some ways to mitigate this asynchrony. There are uh, established patterns that you use. Uh, there are libraries. There's the async library. It's just called async. That's a very nice uh, asynchronous control flow library that people like very much. Uh, for more complicated uh, flavors of asynchrony, there are things like promises. There's a bunch of different implementations of promises out there. 
in JavaScript. So here's an example of the API for our promise uh, that a gentleman named Bob Ramika at Yammer wrote. Basically, the idea is if you have some, a series of asynchronous events and you don't necessarily know what order they're going to happen in, uh, you give them each names and then add a callback to the promise so that when each of those steps of the promise are satisfied, you, do, you execute your thing. Uh, if, if they've already been uh, satisfied and you add your callback, then you just execute, uh, go straight to the execution. This is a really nice pattern for when you're dealing with some sort of, say for example, an asynchronous initialization uh, process and your code is executing at some point during this process and you don't know how much of it or if any of it's been done. So you write this promise and it will go off and either do the things or if the things are already done, it will just execute your callback. Uh, it's an incredibly uh, useful tool when you have a slightly more complicated asynchrony. So the last uh, lesson for asynchrony is don't be asynchronous when you don't need to be asynchronous. So there's sort of this weird religious attachment in the Node community. Like any new community, they're very excited about their, their new tool. Uh, and a lot of people are interested in Node because of the speed which the, this asynchronous invented model provides, right? So people from different programming language backgrounds come into the Node community, they get very excited about this asynchronous model, and then suddenly everything is asynchronous, right? Uh, don't do asynchrony unless it's necessary. So uh, if you're doing I.O., clearly it needs to be asynchronous. If you're doing something that's uh, amenable to the evented approach, where things are happening and you don't know when they might be happening, that's good asynchrony. Um, if you're breaking processing up, if you have a, a long-running uh, process that's chewing on some data, breaking that up to give the JS process to do other things in between so that you can block uh, exclusively on your uh, computation for a long period of time, that's good asynchrony. Don't be asynchronous if you don't need to. Okay, and so a few lessons learned here uh, from Node, uh, running Node in production like actual specifics about things that we have tripped over. So the first one, of course, is that the Node ecosystem is still pretty new, so uh, libraries are a little bit volatile. We don't have the problem that other communities, say, for example, the Scala community might have with libraries being orphaned because uh, there's not a large community. Uh, the JS community, the, the people who are interested in JS and are interested in Node is very, very large, and the number of people who've ever done any JavaScript is like, everybody, right? So uh, the, the end result is that libraries, if they're important, uh, tend not to get orphaned. Someone tends to pick them up and keep the ball rolling, uh, but they do change. Uh, so NPM is great. NPM is Node's package manager. Uh, you might not want to rely on NPM for your deploy story and running a private NPM server, uh, although it's an option for some people, we found to be too big of a pain in the ass. We didn't want to do it. So one of our, uh, one of our uh, projects actually checks in the dependencies. That's kind of the done thing now in the Node community is just check your dependencies in. And then when they change, check them in again. Um, another project pulls down tagged uh, tarballs from GitHub before the deploy. Um, some people do like running their uh, private NPM uh, server though. Uh, I should mention too, NPM has a new feature called shrink wrap, which lets you specify uh, version uh, dependency versions. It's similar to a bundler if you've ever used, uh, if you've ever done stuff with Rails. Right, so this is probably the most important lesson, trying to run a Node app in production in lar in, at, at a f fair amount of scale. Um, first of all, uh, the, the server-side JavaScript and Node uh, story is not at the level of maturity as Java. So there's no instrumentation of the runtime um, yet. The, the, the guys at Joint have done a lot of interesting work with the smart OS and Dtrace, uh, integrating that with Node. So if you're using their stack, you get a bunch of cool introspection data about what's happening inside of the app and the runtime. It's still fairly new. Uh, we're just deploying to EC2, so we don't have all of that. The biggest uh, problem that you have practically running your Node.js app is that when a callback gets run, it's run in a new scope, a new execution scope, so the stack has been reset. When something goes wrong, it's not a question of if something goes wrong, when something goes wrong, you get an error that, isn't, that doesn't have, it has an error message and a, and, a, and a very limited stack that has nothing to do with where the er error actually came from. This is a huge problem. Um, there's some work being done uh, from the Node Core guys, 
something called domains, which is supposed to mitigate this problem, uh, but we don't have it yet. So there are some uh, ways to uh, mitigate this issue. The first one, the first one is the uncaught exception handler, and I'll give you a quick example of how that works. Um, the normal default behavior in Node, uh, the, in the JS runtime, when uh, an unhandled exception occurs is to print the error out and exit, which is probably fine if you're running some sort of a script, but that's not what you want to have happen uh, in a long-running server process, right? So I'm going to go ahead and throw an error, throw a new error, right? And we'll say like, yikes or something. So here's an error getting thrown. We'll go back to our server. Oh yeah, this is the, you can see this proxy too, all of the, uh, oops, all of the stuff. This is all of the stuff that it was proxying, images, HTML, CSS, all of it, all right? So let's start up the proxy again, and we'll go back and we'll try to load this page again. And it's going to freak out and die, right? Which is obviously not what you want in a server process. So the done thing is, process. The, pr the process itself is also an event listener, uh, an event emitter. Uncaught exception, right? And you get a function with a copy of the error in it. And we're just going to console.log, you know, caught, caught error. Right. And then the error dot and the message for the error, right? And we'll see what happens here. So we'll reload again. Right? Nothing happening in the browser still, but at least the server is still running, right? Sadly though, the browser is still sitting on this open connection, and it will sit on this until it gets sick of waiting and times out, right? This is not ideal, obviously. The problem comes in. Let me think of how to explain this. It's an, it's an evented server, so the single pro, you don't have a single process dealing with a single response request response pair at a time. It may be juggling any number of requests at a time. So when this error happens, handling the correct response, the right response, uh, can be a problem. So the way to deal with that is to use, uh, apply a technique uh, that it is very, it was originally very, very useful on the client side in JavaScript whenever you're making some sort of a call off into some dubious uh, service that may or may not come back. And that is to preemptively handle, it's a preemptive error, preemptible preemptive error. So you set timeout function, right? And so what you do is, as I said in the slide, you just assume that you're fucked, right? So you server response dot write. So we're going to go ahead and write out an error before the fact. And then server resp dot write. You know, oops, something went wrong. Server resp dot end. OK, and we'll give it, say, I don't know, five seconds before it does this. So basically, you're throwing an error in the future, and then if things turn out hunky-dory, you cancel the error. So we still have to do the canceling part. We get a handle. The set timeout function in JS gives you, re returns a handle to that timeout. So what we'll do is we'll just come down here, and whenever we actually get a real response from the client, we'll do a clear timeout on the handle. Right? So if things turn out OK, we just say, that whole error, just kidding. Don't, don't do the error, right? But if we actually get an error, which we're getting here, I'm just manually throwing the error, we should get an actual usable response for the right, for the right request response pair, and the server should stay up and running correctly, right? So we see our caught error here, and after five seconds, eventually, we see it actually writes out an error response, which is what we want, something useful in the browser. So this combination of the uh, uncaught Exception handler and the preemptible error technique thing turns out to be very, very useful uh, when you're dealing with this asynchronous uh, evented programming model. The timeout registry is just a sort of a fancier version of that. It's a big data structure where you put entries in by an ID with a stated uh, uh, timeout interval. So I'm going into this potentially dubious step of execution I don't know if it's going to finish or not. And if it doesn't finish in 10 seconds, like respond uh, appropriately. So you define the timeout handler. You define the interval. And uh, so then you have all of these entries living in this uh, data structure and a, a process that will poll it. 
looking for things that are past their freshness date. If it finds anything that's past the freshness date, it will appropriately respond to the client that, hey, something went bad in this whole lengthy process. Um, you know, you know, deal with it, deal with the actual error. Um, this is really important in our upload service because we have so many steps, many of which are asynchronous. We have the thumbnailing step that's happening on the hard drive while it's streaming it to Amazon and while it's streaming it to these third-party services. And any piece of that can break, obviously, if you're dealing particularly with third-party services. Um, and so being able, to, uh, being able to respond correctly to the, the client is uh, really, really important. This is an example of what the API would look like for that. Um, you register the you register the item. You you know call registry foo, pass it that, and I guess actually it's registry dot add foo with a particular timeout, and then you do registry dot clear when you're done. Pretty simple API for that. Oh, and then of course I should add too. You've got your uncaught exception handler, but there's this comment like to do right, do some kind of logging. Like really do the logging. It's really important because you will be surprised at the number of weird, unhandled, unanticipated things that end up happening, particularly if you're using third-party libraries. Um, because sometimes you'll be doing things in a way that your third-party library that you're using didn't expect and they didn't plan for. And the only way you're going to find anything out about where this error is happening in your app is by logging the exceptions and be beginning the detective work, digging through the, digging through the uh, execution flow and figuring out where it is. So on that note, uh, the more vis obviously the more visibility you can get into your app, the better. You want to measure the shit out of everything. We use uh, Mike Ibe's uh, JavaScript port of Coda Hale's uh, Scala metrics library. Uh, Mike also works at Yammer. He wrote it for this upload service initially, uh, but it's on GitHub now. It's open source. Uh, you want to measure everything. You want to log everything. The more visibility, obviously, um, the better. And I guess the last thing that's probably worth mentioning is sort of maybe a little off the beaten track. It's more of the, the human element. I know that a lot of us, probably most of us, are coders and we like sort of squatting in our cave and doing our thing. And we don't like dealing with annoying people, right? Computers are very easy to understand because you know they're not deliberately being perverse, right? Um, so. If you're, if, you're trying to, if you're trying to deploy a node service or you're trying to sort of champion a node service at your, uh, at the, at your place of business, being proactive uh, in being a good citizen goes a long way. So consult with your ops guys. Uh, ask them questions like, you know, what port should this be running on? What should the health check, what type of data should the health check resp uh, respond with? What should the deployment uh, script look like? Um, engage them and ask their opinions. It makes a big difference when their pager goes off at 3 a.m. because of your crazy pants node service that you've deployed. You know, something's gone wrong with that. If you've actually asked them uh, up front and engaged them. Uh, it's also very important to be transparent with the way uh, that you respond when there are problems. Uh, because they can see that you're doing this sort of due diligence that you need to do and that you're, when there is a problem, that you're responding in the, appro the organizationally appro uh, appropriate way. Um, yeah, so this is particularly important because Node is so new. So a, uh, the example that I always use here is um, when the upload service was up and running uh, initially, it, uh, it was a rough beta. And so there were some issues with it. But as time went by, it, became, it stabilized and became very, very stable. But the process, the entire upload process, is something that actually involves this upload service, the browser, Rails. It has to talk to Rails as well. Uh, it also has to talk to these third-party services. And given all of the moving parts, there is some frequency of bad things happening. Um, and in a lot of cases, once we were past the beta phase, the problem was guys in the Rails stack broke stuff, right? But from the end user's perspective, they're just trying to upload something and it's not working, right? And because Node is new and this service was new, the presumption always was that the Node service was broken, right? Even though, no, 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 it was Rails that was broken, right? So the more you can engage your ops guys and operate uh, in a transparent way, the more you can mitigate these assumptions that because it's new, it's going to be sort of freaky and unstable. Um, yeah. So lastly, I would encourage you um, just to try it, just build something with Node. Um, I've been doing JavaScript for kind of a long time, obviously front-end stuff. 
uh, for a long time. There is a certain amount of hype uh, around Node. There's a lot of excitement around Node and hype. As a, an old sort of curmudgeon JavaScript guy, I have to admit the hype irritates me even. And I'm even like a JavaScript person, right? Um, so ignore all of the hype and the fanboyism. Actually try it. Do something with it. And I think that you'll find that for certain uh, types of tasks, it's an incredibly powerful and very, very useful tool. Um, I think it's a, another good tool for you to have uh, in, your, in your arsenal, in your, in your tool belt. So uh, lastly, again, I'm MDE on Twitter, if you're interested in hooking up on Twitter. Um, I work at Yammer. Uh, there's the Yammer Developer Center that you might be interested in looking at if you're interested in working with the Yammer API. We also have an engineering blog where there's a bunch of interesting technical uh, articles on a lot of different technologies. I, you saw that long list at the beginning. Um, we do lots and lots of Java at Yammer. Uh, so you, there might be, uh, there's likely some Java uh, articles uh, or posts on the engineering blog that you might find interesting. Uh, and I guess lastly, just a very quick mention, uh, this week we have some guys from the home office in San Francisco, developers who have gone to our new London office. Uh, what was formerly a sales office is now being opened up to development as well. So if anyone is interested in relocating to London or lives in London or is interested in relocating to SF, we are very, very interested uh, in hiring uh, developers, JS developers obviously, Ruby developers, Java developers, um, .NET. Uh, it's a great place to work. Uh, so if anybody is interested in possibly working in either of those loca locations, um, please uh, definitely come up and talk to me uh, so we can get in contact. So, yeah. thank you.